Hello, everyone, and welcome to this session of Classroom 2.0 Live for Saturday, December 7th. Our show today is on building 21st century classrooms with the Common Core. Um, I am Lori Moffitt, one of the three um, regular show hosts, along with Peggy George and Tammy Moore. And thank you to Tammy for doing the closed captioning for today's show. Our special guests today are Tracy Watanabe, Watanabe didn't get it right again, sorry Tracy, uh, John Castellano, <laughs> thank you, Shauna Hammond, Amber Moore, and Jody Walker, all from the Apache Junction, Arizona, um, a group from, from Apache Junction, Arizona. All right, here's the slide that shows us the live binder for today. The link at the bottom of the slide is not clickable. However, Peggy's placed the link for the live binder in the chat. So you can take the link to the live binder directly from the chat. Notice that the individual pages of the live binder are in the left-hand column. They're no longer across the top of, of the live binders. All of the Classroom 2.0 Live shows are recorded and they're posted at the Archive and Resources page. Here's the link for that page. Again, it's not a live link, but Peggy's also posted that into chat. And there are even more resources than just the recordings on the Classroom 2.0 Live page. We always like to find out where in the world people are signing in from. And this is where that we ask you to participate in the show by going ahead, going ahead and clicking that laser pointer. I'm located in central Pennsylvania. I, I know Peggy's from Phoenix, Arizona. Tammy's logging in from southwest Arkansas. And out, the most of our presenters are from uh, Arizona as well. If the uh, location becomes a little crowded, you can always uh, type in the location in the chat. Yes, all of the, most of the presenters, all of our guest presenters are from Arizona. So it looks like today most of the folks are logging in from the continental US. Although I saw shambles. Here's the first poll question we'd like to ask participants. Are you implementing the Common Core standards in your school or district? And then this is where you use the yes or no from the what looks like a check mark in a box near your name at the top of the left column. And I'll publish those. And out of those that voted, 44% say yes, they are implementing Common Core standards. Yeah, that's right, Peggy. If you don't have a school or a district, it is hard to answer that question. So that might be the case for almost half of the room. Or you might not have been able to find the polling quite yet. The next question is, are you participating in the Global School Project, or have you participated in, in the past? This is also yes or no. And I'll go ahead and post these. And it looks like about a third of those who who voted are not participating. The next question, are you or your students connecting with other classrooms around the world? I'm going to clear the last one. Through blogging or other projects.
All right, I'll go ahead and post those now. And we have about 24% who are, 27% who haven't. So almost a quarter for both yes and no for that. I'd like to now introduce our topic for today, Building 21st Century Classrooms with the Common Core. And I'll introduce John Castellano who is the Director of Technology at Apache Junction Unified School District. Um, I'll ask the newbie question of John, what are, what are the Common Core standards and how do you find time to integrate technology with all the standards you have to teach? And then John will introduce the rest of his team today. Well, good morning, everybody. I uh, appreciate uh, the opportunity to be here, and I look forward to our time together today. Um, to quickly uh, answer uh, the, our, our newbie questions, um, what are the Common Core standards? Uh, just very simply, um, you know, the Common Core standards are educational standards for the 21st century student. Um, they're designed to go deeper into topics um, and provide a more hands-on approach with a focus on what students will, will really use in life. As far as our second question on how do you find time to integrate technology with all the standards you have to teach, um, I mean, that's a great question. But with the, with the Common Core, technology standards have been embedded into the, into the standards themselves. So what this does is it helps with integrating technology into the classroom environment without it feeling overwhelming and like we have two complete separate set of standards to teach, which is kind of how it has, has been in the past. Um, and even if you aren't a Common Core uh, a state, or um, you still have uh, some sort of educational standard. So taking a similar approach can still really apply and really help uh, with the technology integration in the classroom. Um, I do. I do want to quickly uh, introduce uh, everybody today. Um, this is the, gosh, the, probably the third time now that this group has been able to present together, um, and it just gets more and f more fun uh, each time. Um, Tracy Watanabe, who is our district's technology integration specialist, uh, obviously former classroom teacher. Um, I was able to kind of steal her out of the classroom a few years, years ago and bring her to the district level, um, where she's been able to really touch uh, teachers and students uh, with technology integration all across uh, our, our district. So. Um, great, great, great to have her on board. Um, Jody Walker, another former classroom teacher. Uh, she's been a Title I specialist, uh, excellent classroom teacher, now a collaborator, a common core coach uh, for the school district. And uh, really, really uh, great to have her knowledge uh, here with us today. Our two teachers today, um, amazing classroom teachers. There's just not enough that I can say about both Amber Moore and Shauna Hammond. They are uh, always willing to uh, take chances when it comes to uh, technology integration in their classroom. They're always open to having us in their classroom and the projects that they will share with you today are just amazing. So looking forward to having them speak to you. Quick just over you today. Uh, obviously, we're talking about Common Core, 21st century learning, global collaborations, and project-based learning, and how they all go hand in hand. Not separate, four or five separate things we're talking about, but I think you'll see today how all of these work with one another. Some of the key ideas, um, obviously, like we said, Common Core was written for 21st century learners. Uh, the shifts in Common Core and 21st century learning do move away from knowledge and focus more on the skills. Um, technology obviously helps students connect learning beyond the four walls of the classroom. And, and you know, that doesn't just go for students, but it goes for our teachers and, and our adults uh, as well. Um, teachers, Common Core coaches, ed techs, tech directors, uh, they all work together to help with the Common Core implementation. So 
think uh, hopefully at the end of the day you kind of get a, an idea about how all the pieces do work together, even including myself as a technology director uh, and a former classroom teacher also. It's, it's about working together to make this happen. So it's, uh, we want to take just a second, give you a few seconds to um, let us know what were you hoping to learn from this session today. And uh, uh, I'm going to let uh, Tracy Watanabe take over now. Um, but give you a few seconds to, to share if you'd like to in the chat. Yeah, go ahead and um, type into the chat a few things that you were hoping to learn from this session. And we would like to hear from you to make sure that we address all of those as we go through this. Good question about the professional development um, through this. We'll go ahead and talk about that a little bit as well. And then new ideas and resources for blogging. Great. Anything else? All right, it looks like a few more people are typing, and um, we will go ahead and look at those as we go through this. All right, so some of the things that we're going to talk about today is 21st century learning, and it's always good for us to start off by defining what we mean by that. So 21st century learning, we're talking about the creativity, innovation, communication, collaboration. Um, for curation, we're talking about the being able to go online and find the information that we need when we need it and for students to be able to not only access what they need but to also to contribute back and then digital citizenship that's just being a good citizen in the digital world of course the technology skills as well as far as global collaborations that is coming together and staying together in the process and um, staying together and collaborating online together um, for project-based learning, what we're talking about is students being able to learn through projects, not something that they do at the end. So they don't have a unit that's taught and then at the end they do a project. So let me give you this example. What you see on the screen is something that they did in eighth grade. It was um, a CSI mock accident scene that was created by the police department of Apache Junction in our our school parking lot and the students had to use Newton laws to figure out what happened at the end of the project over um, series of weeks they had to present back to the police department using Newton's laws so it wasn't something that they did at the end of their learning unit, but it was something that they did during and that's what we mean by project-based learning as far as the common core goes um, what you heard John say earlier is exactly what we're talking about. Common Core is written for the 21st century standards or for the 21st century learner. And even if you go back to the introduction of the Common Core, um, 21st century skills are referenced, specifically outlined as a key design consideration, and it's placed as uh, a portrait of a student who is college and career ready. And they're also interwoven into the anchor standards and standards throughout, and you can see that through specific grade levels. The old standards were really written for the knowledge area, and um, it was more of a multiple choice assessment, but with Common Core, it's really written as skills that students need to apply into different situations. So as we go through this, we're going to be referencing back to this. What I would like to hear from you is what do you think is um, important to make between connections in those shifts in the Common Core and shifts with 21st century learning. And I'd like for you to take a moment to type those into the chat box as well.
I love the discussion going on in the chat box on the side. Absolutely, absolutely. I can do so many things on my side. All right, I'm going to go ahead and hand the microphone over to Shauna Hammond, and she can take it from here. Oh, good morning. We're going to talk a little bit about mystery state Skype, which I know is probably nothing new to a lot of you who are participating. I recognize some names from Twitter and other places, but this is one thing that we think of as an example. Um, of the new way to integrate technology into your standards and into what you do in, on a normal day. Um, Mystery State Skype, is those of you who aren't familiar with it, you connect with another teacher in another state, of course it could be another city, another country too, and you ask each other questions. The other class doesn't know where you are. You ask each other questions, sometimes yes or no questions, sometimes giving them facts about where you are and the other side has to guess. And this is just a, a spin on the traditional geography or research standards, but we're doing it in a real world way where students are obviously engaged, they're interested, they're intrigued, and um, they're learning the way that, that we want them to be learning. They're connecting with other people and, and taking charge of it themselves. All right, and um, I'm Jody, and um, uh, throughout um, my position as the um, Common Core coach, um, I always try to bring it back to the standards. So today, as the teacher share, um, I'll be relating it back to the standards. So um, as you see, the first standard we're going to talk about is speaking and listening anchor standard number one, and um, the big piece with Skyping is um, the range of conversation with diverse partners. So through the mystery Skypes, um, Sean is definitely providing her class with a diverse set of um, partners to collaborate with. This is another spin on, on how to integrate geography and research and speaking and listening skills into your regular classroom instruction. Um, these students were doing a, a research project about national landmarks and um, it, these were fifth graders and part of their curriculum is to learn about the United States. And so instead of doing a standard report, they did a green screen video and talked about where they um, had researched. And then, of course, they published it on the blog, so they have an authentic audience for their work. So once again, um, this activity could be related to the speaking and listening standard. Um, this is actually uh, related to anchor standard number five, make strategic use of digital media and visual displays. Um, what a better way for students to share what they're learning. Um, through the digital media. The green screens are so much fun and they can do so much with it. Good morning. Sorry about that. Uh, I would like to speak with you about something, a project that we did in my class called Verme Composting. Um, it started off as a science project helping kids with the uh, process, but it also became a much more research project as well. The kids actually researched about um, worms and verme composting. Uh, they actually created worm bins. They brought in the food for the worms. They made predictions. They um, just went through the whole process and in the end really had a sense of being able to understand um, the amount of waste that you could reduce and thus help the world. But like I said, there were kids researching and there was actually a final project in the end. So it was an overall great um, reading information text project.
So um, this activity that Shauna did um, right off of that covers three of our um, reading standards for informational text. And one of the standards that um, our teachers seem to have a little bit of a struggle with is the third standard, where it describes a relationship between a series of events, scientific, historical. And that's why this um, unit, this lesson on Vermi Vermi comp composting, if I can talk this morning, um, was so amazing because it was interesting to students that they really did explore this topic um, over multiple um, resources, multiple ideas. So um, Amber did a great job of meeting the needs of the standard. This is a really fun project. Uh, my classroom, uh, and it's completely and totally student-led. This was not my idea at all. This was all them. During uh, Earth Day week, we called it a third grade class, or all the third grade teachers decided to go paperless. So during that time, we had a lot of online resources, and we were going through reading some of them. I was just kind of exploring. So it came from iPads and netbooks, and they're exploring these different things. And one little girl came across a quote or uh, yeah, that said planting one tree could reduce the amount of carbon dioxide in the air by one ton over its lifetime. And she said, well, Mrs. Moore, can we quit plant a tree? I said, well, I don't know, maybe. And so from there, um, the project kind of took on itself. The kids wrote letters to ask permission to be able to plant a tree to promote principles so of persuasive writing. They researched what kind of tree we should potentially plant because we do live in the desert. Um, they had to plan how they were going to uh, come up with the money, and they decided on a bake sale, and they decided that they needed to do some um, kind of promotions. So the kids wrote a script on, on uh, you know, to plan a commercial, and they videoed the commercial, and they edited it, and it went out to all the rooms. It was very successful. They raised $268 for a tree, um, but then it didn't stop there. They got a little excited and decided that, we probably needed two trees because uh, our sort of our principal's office was a missing tree. Um, so once again, they went back to the persuasive writing skills and they wrote a letter to the nursery that we were buying the first tree from asking if they would help us in any way. And they said, yes, so they actually donated a tree. So these kids ended up um, planting two trees for that, which really gave them all a sense of they can make a change, which is important to you know, allow kids that opportunity at such a young age to feel like they have that, they, you know, contributed to the community and then they were able to do an end video as well and that went on to our blog so that we could share what we had done for our community. And um, as you see, there's one standard put up for um, this. There, there, we could list um, slide after slide after slide of all the different standards that um, Amber met with this activity. I love everything that these ladies do, but this is one of my favorites just because it was so student-led and student-driven. But one of the standards for speaking and listening is integrate and evaluate information um, presented in diverse media. And they absolutely did this in so many different levels, um, researching, um, presenting, sharing the commercials to the students um, online. It was all um, about the diverse media and the diverse format. This project came about, this is Sean again, and Amber and I did this together with our third grade classes last year, came about as a result of the, glass, the Global Classroom Project, and a, a which is a great way of collaborating, connecting with teachers who are all over the world. I see some members of that project in our um, members of this group today. And um, a teacher from South Africa posted a picture online of her um, vacation in South Africa, some pictures of rhinos that she had taken pictures of at a nature preserve and said that that rhinos in South Africa were terribly endangered and that most of the pictures or most of the rhinos in the picture that she had taken would be um, would have been killed by the time that we saw the picture and our little students in 
Arizona who have never seen a rhino before were just passionate about this. They just took this on and said, why and, and what is happening? And of course, we found out that the um, the main reason why they're being killed is because of poaching, and they're poached because of um, people want to use their horns in medicine and things like that. People think that it's medicine, but it's not really. And so they did all kinds of research about the types of rhinos and all kinds of, of research and just were extremely passionate about this. They wrote letters to the president of South Africa. They made a video and put it on YouTube to tell other people about it. They um, participated in a mega conference where they presented their their um, research to kids from all over the world and classrooms from all over the world. And this brought them together, of course, brought together lots of standards too. Our, they had not only just reading and writing and speaking and listening standards, but math standards and science standards and social studies. Um, they brought all of these things were connected and integrated throughout a several week-long project, or it actually lasted more than that, it lasted pretty much the rest of the year. Um, and again, student-driven, this is their, you know, they became passionate about this and, and we just took it as far as they wanted to. Okay, in a moment, Peggy is going to um, start this video for us. It's the project that Shauna's and Amber's students created. I'll let Shauna talk a little bit more about that. Um, but as it's getting ready, if you have any delay in watching the video, I think Peggy will go ahead and put the live screen on the side as well. One little extra thing about this is just, I think as teachers, it's a, it's a mind shift for us that, of course, students, when they want to get their message across, they want to put a video on YouTube or they want to put post something on their blog. And where, you know, five years ago, we might have done posters or done something like that, which, are, which is still great, um, using this technology, which is so easily accessible and what it's common to the students makes it more real world for them. So as um, we think about this um, lesson that the students did, it um, meets the needs of our reading anchor standard number seven, where they have to integrate and evaluate content presented in diverse media and formats. But um, they had to do so much research. Um, so they were obviously looking at so many different um, media formats and, um, and doing such a fabulous job with their research. Um, and I just love the video where their faces are so serious. And I know Shauna shared that she did. I said, did you tell them to look so serious? And, and she said, no, they just did it. So um, we knew that they understood the, the, the impact and, and the importance of this.
So in order to be connected globally, you have to find other people to connect with. So um, we wanted to talk about how we find some of our global collaborations. Um, I think the, the main thing that we do is to connect with other teachers via Twitter and Edmodo, um, both things that I think most people are, are familiar with. If you're not, um, you know, those are things that are just so easy to connect with if you want to find somebody or another classroom who's interested in doing the same types of things that you are. Um, we connect via blog. We both have blogs and we'll be talking about that. And that's a key part of really, we couldn't teach without blogs anymore. Um, we are members of the Global Classroom Project and connect with other teachers through that and you'll have share links to all of those things. Um, I believe there's a link to Projects by Jen, if you haven't heard of that one. It's a, 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 project, a teacher in California, Jen Wagner, who has um, fantastic projects that are already made and she organizes the whole thing for you. And so when we're encouraging other teachers at our school to participate, it's mostly K through six, but there's some other things that are for older kids. Um, that's a great way to get your feet wet in global collaborations. And then the relationships that you make through those things, they lead to other things. So the Rhino project would not have come up about if we hadn't met you know, Karen via the Global Classroom Project. And all of these things, you have to see what your, your students are interested in, but you can guarantee that there's another class somewhere in the world who's interested in the same thing. So we'll provide links to you for all those uh, ways that you connect, connect with each other. All right, so the live binder has those links. But what we'd like to hear from you are what are the benefits of this type of learning? And feel free to chat. Um, go ahead and type down your thoughts in the chat box on the side. That'd be great. The comments are still scrolling in, so continue typing those. That's exactly what we want to hear. Um, exactly everything you're saying is what I was going to say next about the Common Core being written for 21st century learners and that students need to be able to apply these skills. And it's about um, it being relevant to them and it's about connecting with others and that audience is just making it so um, real for them. Just thinking about the students in Amber's room saying, can we go ahead and plant a tree? Well, why can't we? Can't we make a difference? And let's let's do something to impact the world. These are the, the outcomes of what's coming out of this type of learning, which is absolutely phenomenal. Um, and for us to just keep in mind that the 21st century learning is embedded into the Common Core and it's really written for that 21st century learner. No longer can I have conversations with teachers saying, um, Hey, Tracy, I don't have time to integrate technology because it's written into the common core. It really is. So it's part of just what we're supposed to do. And that's the transition that we're at right now, which is really exciting. Very exciting for us. So um, in, in looking at this, I'm going to go ahead and hand this over to Jody to talk about some of the shifts that she is seeing as an instructional coach. So um, as Tracy mentioned, with the Common Core, or even if you're not um, a Common Core state, um, we're all looking for ways for um, 21st century learners. So um, with all of the work that I do with teachers, um, you know, it, it, it's ingrained in the standards, but then we always um, try to find ways to take it that next step, to take it into that 21st century learning. Um, you know, how are you going to share this with um, other students, how the students going to share it, how are you going to um, publish it, um, that's always the focus. And um, one of the ways that teachers are really starting to embrace this idea is through blogging. And so that's where we're going to spend some time um, talking next is about blogging and some things that we've done in our district.
All right. So with that, um, I'm going to go ahead and start talking about blogging community. Um, blogging in our school district really started when um, we uh, uh, got involved with the teacher blogging challenge and student blogging challenge through EduBlogs. Um, my boss, John Castellano, director of technology, decided to put his blog and my blog on the um, district webpage, and I said to myself, I better really know what I'm doing. So at that point, I was involved in the teacher blogging challenge, where I've met a lot of you, actually. And that's how I learned how to set up my blog. So from there, um, I saw that there was the student blogging challenge, and I thought, gosh, this would be a great way to introduce students. Let me give it a try. So I went into a classroom. I was actually a first-year teacher with a, a very um, wide population of students. And I worked in her room with the student blogging challenge, and the impact that it made was phenomenal. And from that point, other classrooms were wanting to know more about that. And we um, started seeing blogs through our campus blogs popping up all over the district. And it was, that was just really the start of the blogging communities in our district. And from there, um, I'm going to go ahead and have Amber share a little bit more about the blogging impact in her classroom. Amber's trying to connect back to the, the network. Um, give her another moment to try, and otherwise, Shauna will probably take over for her. <laughs> Sorry about that. I'm not sure what happened. Um, our classroom blog is an excellent tool for uh, student writing, and it hugely affects how, they, um, how their writing can improve. When students are just writing for a teacher, they just they don't really take much to it. But I noticed the second we started actually leaving comments on blogs or even student posts that there's a huge increase in awareness of um, errors or what, what sounds correct, um, the words that they use. And it's, it's really been a huge thing. Um, after we had a video conference with a, a zoo in Minnesota, uh, we did a blog post, which was exciting. And then what was even more exciting was the next day when a class from New Zealand left us a comment and um, said that they were really interested to see the beavers and left us some links to look at in my class. It just blew their mind that somebody so far away would care enough to read what we had written and respond back. And so that's just, it's just that awareness that somebody out there is reading what you're writing and therefore it needs to be good. And um, so, as we mentioned that, um, you know, we start talking about blogging, and as we look at this writing anchor status for the Common Core, um, it doesn't say blogging, but it might as well, because I don't know how better of a um, way to meet the need of the standard, especially to publish the writing and to interact and collaborate with others um, through blogging. One thing I love about blogging is the way that it allows you to sort of be more organic with your teaching, more creative, and respond to the interests and needs of, of the students. Um, we had an opportunity last year to talk to some scientists in Antarctica. They were doing a webinar, and um, they were taking live questions from classes and things like that. And the, the science was above my student's head, but they were really intrigued with the idea of talking to people in Antarctica. And as we were watching the, the presentation, they showed some slides of where they were, and they showed a picture of a penguin. And I should say these scientists were um, doing some research at the South Pole, right directly at the South Pole, and they showed a picture of a penguin. And the scientists all started laughing and said, obviously, this is not the South Pole. And so we continued with the webinar, and, and then when we were finished, the students had the, the authentic question, why were there no penguins at the South Pole? They thought, you know, they learned about penguins, and to them, Antarctica and South Pole are the same thing. Um, so they just assumed that the penguins were at the South Pole, not realizing that they had to live along the coast of Antarctica. So instead of um, saying, you know, just 
and telling them the answer, we looked at that as an opportunity for a sort of spontaneous research project, and they had to look it up, and they ended up finding the blog of another scientist who researched penguins in Antarctica and started communicating with her via the blog, and she um, had a, a program where she would send them a, a postcard from Antarctica and uh, ended up being a very, you know, something that was not part of my curriculum or wasn't part of um, anything I planned to teach that year, but because of the interest, um, grew into, um, you know, something that was a great learning experience for them. And then when we posted about it on our blog, students from England who had, uh, I don't know how they ended up on our blog, but they um, left comments and then we ended up connecting with them and had another writing project that we did with them and developed a relationship. So that relationship that you develop via the blog extends the learning even further. And um, I could, I really could just sit here and tell you all of these projects are my favorite projects. Um, this uh, project really spoke to the writing standards, um, again, to publish and interact with others, but also to gather relevant information. Um, when Shauna's students were confused about penguins and Antarctica, she could have simply given them the correct information and moved on, but instead she embraced it as another learning opportunity, and they went so much further and um, it took their writing so much further. All right. I'm going to show a little video just of um, students after reflecting on a project. These are former fifth grade students of mine from a couple of years ago, reflecting on a project. And um, what they say has some, um, you know, makes you think about why projects and doing that type of learning has an impact on them. Project is easier because then you could feel it. You feel it, remember it, you could have you could still remember it in your fingers. I will remember it because <coughs> I <coughs> will remember making the solar clickers because of pictures or videos or the blog. And, and audiences are the best thing to have. Because if you, like for an exam, you don't have, you only have one other person that can see it, which is a teacher. But if you have like it on a blog, then All right. So um, at a district level, we saw the impact of blogging um, in the classroom. About a quarter of our third grade classes had classroom blogs that they engaged in daily. So with that quarter of bloggers um, at the third grade level, we had um, benchmarks twice a year. Those were just internal exams where they had a writing prompt, but they all had the same prompt. It was graded on the six traits. And the classrooms that had blogging as a daily routine, we noticed that their scores were a whole point higher than everyone else's in the district. And a couple of those third grade teachers were, it was their first year teaching third grade even. So it was really the blogging piece that we saw as that um, changing piece. And we saw that at a district level. Um, at a district level as well, what John and I have are our own blogs, and they serve as resources for others in our, in our district and also outside of our district. Um, for Common Core, for technology integration, 21st century learning, um, change, how to influence culture. And not only do they serve as resources, but it's also a model of what we want to see of other administrators in our district and other educators as well as students. So that's something that we do at a district level to help promote that blogging culture in our district. Um, 
another thing that we do is we um, really focus on building our PLN, um, personal learning networks, through blogging, through Twitter, Digo groups, um, Pinterest, and whatever type of social media we use. Um, the screenshot there is just an example. Um, uh, the one with Sue White, she's the one that writes the student blogging challenge, and she helped connect one of our fourth grade classrooms with one of her classrooms in Australia, and they um, became blogging partners. So, you know, before it was a lot of work for me to kind of start to build that, but now it's just really easy because I have the, those connections made so that resources come to me even. So it's actually made what I do easier. Um, I'm going to go ahead and turn the mic over to John to talk about it from a technology director's standpoint. Thanks, Tracy. Um, I mean, if you look at all these projects that uh, around technology, there's obviously a lot going on in the background that, that needs to happen to make them possible. And so, you know, that's where from a district uh, level support that myself and my staff uh, come into play. And, and then importance of everyone working together and communicating is, is is critical. I mean, all these things wouldn't happen if all the blog spots were blocked or if Sean and Amber couldn't get to certain websites because they didn't have access because the content filter was blocking them. We're not just a wide open district, of course, but uh, when teachers need to get something, if it does happen to be blocked, then they let us know and, and we'll unblock it for them. So. Open access is very, very important and key. Um, a lot of districts just will hold tight and won't open things uh, that, that really should be open. And so that's a topic that has to be discussed. If, if that's happening at your campus, you need to discuss that with your administration and, and just be open about it uh, and, and let them know why uh, you need access to these sites. And, you know, they need to work at the district level. Uh, all the way down with the technology department so that those things happen. So it's key to get every everyone involved. Uh, mobility is, you know, obviously desktop computers uh, don't fill our classrooms today, but mobile devices do or should. You know, we shouldn't be tied to one spot. So mobility is important for some of these kids to go outside and to film their activities that they are doing. You can't do that with a stationary device. So mobility is important. And bandwidth is critical. Obviously, we need more and more bandwidth to be able to connect to the world. So uh, those are topics that just need to be openly discussed uh, so that uh, if your technology department isn't on that page, uh, they need to be on that page with you. Absolutely. So kind of here are our key, I, key takeaways, again, that we discussed earlier. Um, you know, like I've said over and over a couple times now, it takes everybody working together. As a district, we're not uh, necessarily where we need to be yet, but with everyone helping, with Tracy, our Common Core coaches, Jody, our administration on the same page, um, you know, I, I think we'll get there, and that's what's important to, to uh, remember when we're talking about the Common Core uh, or any educational standards for that part. The teacher cannot do it alone in their classroom. They need support and everyone working together um, to get there. So with that, uh, I think we can, though. So here are some resources. And I'm not sure, Tracy, if you wanted to say anything about these resources. I believe these are also included in the live binder. Yes, they're all in the live binder. So if you have any questions for us um, in the chat, and um, I'll go ahead and have Lori take over from here. But if you have any questions for us, go ahead and raise your hand and maybe hand back the facilitation to, to Lori. Thanks, Tracy. I did manage to capture some questions as they went by. So I'll go back to the top of my list for the questions that have not been answered yet. Uh, how, how did the... Uh, how do you get access to learning about using green screen? Uh, is that resource in the live binder? Because one of the early uh, projects had to do with the green screen back backgrounds. Yeah, I saw that in there. It was a really good question. That was actually a resource that I don't have in there, but I will go back um, and put some resources in there. So uh, give us a little bit of time, but we will go ahead and, and um, put some in there. That's a good question. 
thanks. Um, I think you, you or Peggy, somebody answered this one from Wes. Uh, I love this list of tech-related anchor standards. Are they in the live binder as well, or will they be? I believe um, Peggy's going to go ahead and put in all the slides. And if you want, I can go back and put those as well. I saw that earlier, and that was another really, really good point. Uh, Stig Mama had a question about how does, does she get the kids to make their own videos? How do they start doing that? I think if you put technology in front of the students and just tell them what, give them some vague, um, guidelines of what they're supposed to do, they figure it out. That sounds simplistic, but it's true. <laughs> you put an iPad or a netbook in front of students and, um, you know, hand them a digital camera or uh, the camera on the back of the iPad and they will figure it out. Um, there's lots of apps for editing and things like that. Um, there's really endless varieties of ways of doing it, um, including, you know, lots of free ways of doing it. So um, I think that, that the kids find you know, they, they see a video on YouTube and they say, oh, how did they do this? And let's figure out how to do this. Even, you know, our third graders do this. So um, I don't think you need to be an expert. Just put it in front of them and let them try and figure it out. Mm -hmm. That's great. That, that, that they, they take, well, and then that also becomes authentic learning because they learn the details of how to work the technology by actually doing it. Um, do you have librarians? This person was sort of disappointed that they weren't on the list to help with implementation. So, yeah, in our district, I'll let I'll let John take over. Go ahead, John. Oh no, sorry, I didn't mean to jump in there. Um, our district, uh, uh, probably a couple of years ago now, uh, did make the decision to uh, move away from a certified person in the library. Um, so now we have a classified st uh, staff person in the library. So. Was that the right or the best decision to make? Um, you know, uh, you know that's probably open for a lot of discussion. Um, part of it was a budgetary reason for that, which unfortunately we're kind of seeing that more often uh, in school districts. So, um, but that doesn't mean that they don't still do things in the library, um, a number of things, and, and integrating technology. Uh, in some of those libraries is, is still there and they are part of the process. So it really kind of differs from from school to school, but it is not uh, a certified uh, teacher in the library anymore. Thank you, John. Uh, those were the questions that I captured um, that have not, that had not been answered as we went along. I, I had a running list of both. So I'm going to turn the mic over to Peggy to, oh, Stella has another, qu I'm sorry. Go ahead, Stella. You can type in the, ch or Stella left. Looks like Stella had a question. I would love to have Shauna tell us about her geography game. Uh, Shauna, could you do that before we move on to the closing slides? Do you mean GeoGuessr? I'm going to assume that that's what you mean. I can't hear anymore. Sorry. Um, it, maybe it was one of the links on our blog. It's one of our recent blog posts about GeoGuessr. It's um, an online game that um, you, I believe it's G-E-O-G-U-E-S-S-R, not E-R. Dot com. Anyway, it's, it's integrate. It uses Google Maps, and they have to. Uh, it brings up a random location in the world that's used um, using Google Street View and they have to guess where it is. So uh, by panning around and looking around and looking at signs and things like that. So it's just a, it's a free fun game. Um, it's fantastic use of, you know, technology to teach geography though. They learn so much by just looking around the world um, and sort of, you know, kids are naturally drawn to that Google, um, Google Earth and this sort of gives them a, a format and they, they get a, a little bit of a structure. They're not just clicking around, um, but really fun and they love to do that. It's just a great way of spending five minutes to teach a lot of geography.
Thanks, Yana. Peggy, I think you were going to take over from here, correct? Yes, I am. Uh, thank you all so much. And I know Lori will do the closing thank yous too. But this has been a fabulous, inspirational presentation. And you've shared so many great ideas. And I know people are going to want to go back to your blog posts and actually read more about each of those projects that you did. So any any uh, links that you add to the planning doc, I'll make sure they get into the live binder. But we are very excited about our upcoming shows, and I'm so happy that next week we're going to be featuring Wes Fryer. And he has an amazing story to tell us because he is currently teaching in a grade four or five STEM classroom. So he's going to be sharing with us about how they're using coding in games and specifically Hopscotch, Scratch, and Minecraft. So that's going to be a real treat. Then I want to remind you that we won't have any shows the next two weeks so that we can all take a winter break. It's such a busy time for everyone. We may actually have a special show um, after the new year before the sessions start up again and do a SmackDown. So uh, stay tuned for that and we'll tweet about it if that's going to happen. Also, January 11th, we have a great presentation about all the fabulous resources for middle school literacy that are all free in the collection for PBS Learning Media. And Carolyn Jacobs is going to come and share about those. And on January 18th, Adam Bellow is coming back to give us his latest updates on EduClipper and EduTacker and the new iPad app for EduClipper. So we're really looking forward to that. Also, uh, we're very proud to have been nominated for an award in the EduBlogger Awards that are going on right now. And we were nominated for an award in the Best Open PD Unconference Webinar Series. So we'd love to have your support if you would be willing to go to that link and um, uh, vote. And what I wanted to tell you about these EduBlogger Awards, they are fabulous. and the reason that I love them so much is it is a perfect way to build your PLN. If you were to, and they have little Twitter links on every single one of them. So if you were to go to any of those sites and click on the follow on Twitter, you'll have a fabulous PLN. So be sure to check those out and find some other educators that you can connect with. Also want to tell you that this next week there's going to be another webinar um, that Classroom 2.0 Live is uh, co-sponsoring with Barbara Bray and Kathleen McCloskey and their personalized learning webinars. And they're going to be featuring David Truss, who's going to be sharing about the Inquiry Hub. If you haven't heard him talk about that, he is an amazing educator. And the Inquiry Hub is where he is the lead administrator. So he's going to be bringing some of their teachers and learners and himself to present in this webinar. So that link is also on our um, calendar for Classroom 2.0 Live. And Steve Harganon is taking a little break right now from the Future of Education interviews, but he will be returning soon, so we'll let you know when those start up again. Those are always great opportunities to hear from some really amazing educators and authors. And Lori, I'm going to let you take over from here. Thank you, Peggy. You can nominate a featured teacher by filling out the form at this tiny URL.com site, uh, CR20Live Featured Teacher Nominate, but not the E at the end. And you can even nominate yourself uh, to be an upcoming one of the monthly featured teachers. Um, when you exit the classroom, the your browser should open a link to the survey, and the uh, URL is 
going to be in the chat as well. In the live binder, you can find the survey link too. And so there are a number of ways to access the survey for this particular webinar. Make sure, though, when you do complete the survey, that the email address that you use for the, uh, if, you, if you're requesting a professional development certificate, uh, the, that the email address that you put in the survey is a personal email address rather than a school email address. Sometimes schools will block the uh, email, the certificate from getting to you. Our shows are also in two iTunes U collections, one video collection, one audio collection, and you can access the recordings uh, in those manners. Also on the uh, website for Classroom 2.0, you'll find an RSS feed link that will allow you to access show archives in that manner as well. And we want to offer special thanks to our special guests today, Tracy Watanabe, John Castellano, Shauna Hanman, Common, Amber Moore, and Jody Walker, as well as Steve Hargadon, who's the founder of Classroom 2.0, Teacher 2.0, Future of Education, and Web 2.0 Labs Project, uh, certainly for Weebly.com for providing our website and everyone who participated in the show, and also to Blackboard Collaborate for providing this platform. Thanks to all of you for taking time out on a Saturday to come spend some time with us.